As beaver trappers, we have all heard the term used for lower grade beaver, hatters. And earlier in the DVD, we heard from Phil Patterson on exactly what is required in the beaver pelt to make it suitable for use in making hats or felting. Felting is a fascinating process, maybe the oldest form of cloth, way before woven cloth and by far the strongest of the natural fibers. The process has changed little since medieval times. Machinery might have changed, but the process is much the same. Let's take a look. Fur felt used to be a very basic and widely used fabric, but now only has limited applications. As a matter of fact, there is only one cutting plant for processing beaver into felt left in the U.S. That's the American Fur Felt Company located in New Jersey. They cut tens of thousands of beaver pelts each year for two major hat makers. Beaver under fur makes the best quality felt because each individual hair has a series of barbs along the hair shaft that grabs the bars on the surrounding hairs and creates an interlocking system. When these pelts first arrive from the auction house, they are drummed to clean them of any grease and dirt that might interfere with the next step, which is called carroting. In this step, the pelts are treated chemically to elevate the hairs on each barb shaft. This will help the hairs bind even tighter later in the process. It also turns the pelts a deep orange color, hence the name carroting. Early in the history of felting, a chemical mixture containing mercury was used in the carroting process. The men working with this, the hatters, were exposed to the fumes for years, which eventually caused uncontrollable tremors and a form of dementia, giving rise to the term, mad as a hatter. The pelts are then cut into strips. This is done so they can be fed through the cutting machines. In the cutting process, the fur is shaved off the pelt. The fur is then run through a series of large blowers that separate the underfur from the guard hairs. It also separates out any remnants of hide that may have been left from the cutting process. Once the underfur is cleaned and separated, it is rolled out of the blowers and packed for shipment to the hat makers. Currently, there are only two companies left in North America that make hat bodies using high quality beaver felt. The most widely known, Hatco, which makes the iconic Stetson cowboy hat, and also the Resistall line of hats. The bagged fur, as delivered to the hat manufacturer, must undergo several mixing and refining processes before it is ready to be formed into hat bodies. After mixing, the fur has assumed a muddled grayish color, and the original furs entering the mixture can't even be seen. Mixed fur is then blown a process which removes clotted fur, air, and dirt. Fur coming out of the delivery end of the process resembles an endless sheet of gray-absorbent cotton, soft, light, and down. There are two main steps in making fur into a hat. First, the fur is made into a large, loose cone, and then this cone is shrunk and shaped into the finished hat. Forming the cone is really the key to felt hat making. It is done in a forming machine. Picture an upright, cylindrical compartment, and inside this compartment, on the floor, a copper cone about three feet high points upwards. This cone revolves slowly. It is perforated, and an exhaust fan beneath it sucks the air and the loose fur in the chamber down to the cone. The fibers are interangled every which way, but only loosely. The operator carefully wraps damp burlap cloth around the cone, and then immerses it for a short time in a vat of hot water. That's when the felting starts. The hot water shrinks the fibers just a little, but yet enough to knit them into a flimsy layer of felt. The layer of felt is stripped from the cone. It is several times the height of the finished hat, and so delicate that it must be handled with the utmost care. Now the shrinking has begun in earnest, until the body is felted down successfully from its original huge dimensions to its final size. The body is folded, dipped in hot water, and rolled with pressure. This is repeated a number of times, under the action of the hot water and the manipulation, the fibers shrink, their projecting barbs locking together tighter and tighter until when the cone is no bigger than the finished hat, it is so tightly felted that a strong man cannot pull it apart. Machines which do the shrinking are rollers like big wash wringers. These bodies are wrapped in cloth and passed through the rollers, over which the hot water is poured. 
Thus, hand rolling is mechanically simulated. Once the felting is complete and the hat reaches the desired size, a rough shape is obtained by stretching. Crown stretching is done on a machine that has a frame over which the cone is placed, and above this metal fingers. The fingers massage the tip of the cone, pressing the felt between the rib of the frame, thereby stretching it. The brim stretcher grips the brim with metal fingers and works on the same principle. Then the hats are sanding to smooth the felt. The hats are blocked on machines depending on the desired style, and the finished shape is obtained by blocking the crown. In the final step, the brim is impregnated with a stiffening shellac, and headbands are sewn in. All hats are rated on a scale of X's. The higher the number of X's, the more beaver fur in the hat. The very best hats are 4X and made of 100% beaver fur. Beaver pelts are where it all began, but primarily for making felt hats. Although the Native Americans have used pelts for garments since the beginnings of time, it was only much later in the history of the advent of the commercial tanning processes that they found favor in mainstream society. Beaver, in particular, because of its warmth, was a very important part of a northern winter wardrobe. Even today, beaver is coveted for its warmth and stylish looks. In the grading section, we saw how beaver is graded by the density of its underfur. Now, we'll take a look at why this is important. We have all heard that beaver are the most difficult of the wild furs to dress. The process is very exacting and labor-intensive, particularly for some of the traditional garments like sheared beaver. There are only a handful of fur dressers left in the world that have the expertise to properly dress beaver. We are very fortunate to have Norm Byman of the Tubari Fur Dressers explain the fascinating process to us. Tubari not only dresses furs for the fur industry, but also specializes in dressing small lots of trappers' furs. When the furs arrive at Tubari's plant, they are given their own identifying stamp. This consists of a combination of small punch holes specific to each owner. So we will stamp with a hammer stamp and that stamp will be recorded on his work order. The dried pelts are placed in a solution to rehydrate them. This solution is a combination of salt, water, and a few chemicals. Rehydration takes about 12 hours. Even in the first part of the process, the quality of the pelts can have a direct effect on the result of the process. They'll spend the night in this solution. Okay, here I have um, two prime examples of improperly handling of a beaver pelt. This beaver obviously was uh, either left too long before it was uh, skinned or uh, left too long before it was fleshed and dried. And what happens after uh, rehydration, the first rehydration, you can see all the hair is let go. This is due to all the bacteria that is in the, uh, or the protein matter that is breaking down in the uh, leather fibers creating the bacteria to the skin is going to lose all its hair. Pelts that are stale, yellow or oxidized, have been over dried. As a result of being dried too quickly or with too much heat, they don't rehydrate very well. There's a much higher chance that oxidation has caused some damage to the roots of the hair, causing them to slip. Once the good pelts are rehydrated, the pelts are broken or loosened up by hand on a beam or mechanically. This scrapes and loosens the leather side of the pelt and allows it to better absorb the second rehydrating solution. This is the type of machine we use. It's called an automatic fleshing machine. This machine is used to break the leather fibers after the first soak uh, before we put it into the secondary soak in order for uh, better penetration into the leather. Now, you can see how it's opened up the hide completely and scratched the surface of the leather. At this point, the pelts are fleshed for the first time. The second solution also includes a degreaser, which is meant to take all the natural oils out of the pelt. If these are left in, the pelt will decompose and these oils break down through the rest of the dressing process. This process and the soak time for the pelts is very exacting and takes an experienced fur dresser to monitor the process. If the pelts are left too long or the solution is out of balance, all the hair can slip. After this soak, the pelt is fleshed again to take down all the heavy spots on the hide like the shoulders and tail. This is the second of four times the pelt will be fleshed. 
This is a very dangerous operation as these knives are razor sharp. This allows the tanning solution to penetrate all parts of the hide. At this point in the process, if the pelts are to be prepared as sheared beaver, they must have the guard hairs removed. This is referred to as the plucking process. It is the most technically difficult and labor-intensive part of dressing beaver. The intent is to remove all the guard hairs and the immature guard hair stickers and leave the underfur intact and undamaged. Looking at a cross-section of a pelt, the guard hairs are rooted just a few millimeters deeper in the hide than the underfur. The pelts are soaked again in a solution that only penetrates the hide to the layer of the guard hairs and acts to loosen just their roots. It's a very delicate balance not to loosen the roots of the underfur too. The exact formula and the timing is the most highly guarded secret in the fur dressing industry. Just a minor error can be a disaster and ruin thousands of dollars worth of pelts. After the soak, the hide is placed on a beam and the guard hairs and all the new growth hairs are pushed out the pelt. You can see all the white hair coming out. <clears throat> That's the new growth underneath. Now that the long guard hairs are out, now when we pass a second time, you can see all the short white ones coming out. See that? See all the little white ones? That's the new growth. Now, why it has so much new growth on the belly? Why? Because the beaver is always dragging his belly on the ground. So nature's telling the animal, we must grow more fur on our belly. Again, this takes a great deal of skill and expertise. If this process is not done properly, the hairs break off instead of pull out, and the pelt is full of prickly needles called stickers and is useless. Even the most accomplished pluckers can only finish 12 to 15 hides a day. Actually, uh, it's, a, it's a good thing we do the process before, like we are not going to shear some skin like that. Usually we just keep it long hair like I showed you before. So that was a mistake. Okay, it shouldn't have been uh, sheared, but uh, we try to analyze. It's difficult sometimes, but we try to analyze all this before we go further in the process so we don't have too many skin like this because it could have been used, but uh, this one is very damaged too, okay? After the pelts are plucked, they are soaked in another solution to tighten up the grain in the hide and tighten up the roots of the underfur. From here, all the hides, both those that were plucked and those to be tanned, long hair and natural, are put in the tanning pickle. This could take up to 24 hours, but requires years of expertise to judge exactly when the hide should come out of the pickle. They are fleshed again, then into another tanning solution overnight. When they are removed from the solution, they are fleshed again for the fourth time. Next, they are either air dried or dried in dryers, then drummed or milled to break down and soften the leather. The next step is to stretch the pelts to open the grain and allow it to reabsorb the required oils. Okay, what we did was we just backled or re-stretched the skin back. Um, after each milling, the skins always shrink. So what we have to do is we have to backle them and stretch them back to a bigger size and also to suede and, and make this leather softer. The last step in the tanning is to replace those oils in the leather and the fur or dress it up. This is what gives rise to the term fur dressers. After we apply uh, tanning oils to the pelts, we uh, put them into the kicker, and as you can see, it's uh, pounding the oil right through the leather fibers. The shearing is an entirely different process and is performed on the finished tanned fur. It is done by passing the pelts through a cutting machine, and depending on the quality of the underfur, heavy versus semi, as well as the intended final use, the pelt can be shaved to lengths from 16 to 6 millimeters in length. With many of the new fashion and fun furs, sheared beaver lends itself well to dyeing almost any color under the sun. The lighter colors require even an additional step, which is a bleaching process where all the color is removed from the pelt and then dyed. And lastly, the pelts are drummed and cleaned and now ready for the fur designers and manufacturers. This is the part of the processing where the uh, beavers are uh, being put into the mill or the drum to be cleaned. These particular beavers are all plucked and sheared and they're going for their last finish. Following the tanning process for beaver hopefully gives the trappers some feel for the technical expertise and the amount of labor required to produce high quality beaver fur garments. From start to finish, the entire process may take two weeks and the fur manufacturer will often have three times what he paid for the raw pelt, hammer price, and just the dressing process. 
And all this takes place even before it reaches the designers and manufacturers. This also may help trappers understand the difficulties we face in trying to increase and maintain the prices we receive for the beaver pelts. Beaver fur is the oldest and was one of the most sought after furs for garments of all the wild furs. Desirable for its warmth and its beauty, either in its natural state or sheared. For hundreds of years, it has been the backbone of the fur industry. But like everything else, preferences and perceptions change. For example, today, even the most traditional full beaver coat is no longer in style. Old-time furriers of 50 years ago would be hard-pressed to even identify beaver in some of the current fashions. The good news is, since beaver fur lends itself not only to plucking and shearing, but to a whole new range of techniques from sculpting to weaving, it remains one of the most versatile of all the wild furs. Consequently, the garment designs and styles are limited only by the scope of the designer's imagination. As is the case with all fur garments, the design and manufacturing, all the way from the design sketches to the pattern making, is a highly specialized skill. Your company's studio, NAFA, is the world leader in sponsoring design and technical workshops all over the world. The creativity of students and established designers alike are challenged as they are taught the wonders of wild fur. Some of the most beautiful and unique new fashions have come from these workshops. Traditionally, Montreal has been a North American hub of the wild fur industry. A maze of small family-owned garment manufacturers supplies both Canada and the U.S. with tens of thousands of fashionable fur garments each winter season. And it all begins in the creative minds of the furriers and their book of designs. From there, it becomes a pattern, an outline for creating the panels of fur. Each garment requires its own pattern. The pattern maker must understand how each panel blends and complements the others. So now I'm going to cut the pattern. Actually, it's a pattern for a men's uh, garment. Okay, so uh, it's, this is going to be for a shilling coat. So. And I'm doing this uh, for a contractor. We don't do the shilling coat here. So basically on the, this pattern, the canvas was uh, done. Once the pattern is created and cut, it is matched to just the right pelts for that garment. Any damage to the pelts must be meticulously and seamlessly repaired. This gives a little insight into why our damaged goods are so much less valuable than good, well-handled pelts. Basically, we have to uh, repair it, okay, and if it's possible, because sometimes it's almost impossible, but this way, if I do this, I cut these holes like that, okay, and I just follow the, the pattern that, uh, so every, uh, every damage, every skin is different, but we just try to do the best we can we can to contour all these damage like that. So I take off this piece here, okay? So it's very, uh, there's a lot of holes and uh, things like that in it. There's another one in this uh, spot here. So I'm gonna do this, remove the, the bad spot. And then I have to cover this uh, space, okay? So I'm gonna do this, try to avoid uh, too many seams. So in the same seam, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this here. And that's a lot of space to cover. And uh, usually if you do more than three quarter of an inch, it's gonna show. So I'm making a drop like that. So she's gonna move this here like this and this to this hole, okay? And this here. So let's, and I'm doing it in two, uh, two time like that and like this. Okay, now I'm gonna give it to uh, Joanne. She is going to uh, repair it. So that's what's nice about the uh, fur because we can just close all the holes like that, all the space, put it together, then we stretch the leather and we just keep it flat. So 
a skin like this, I'm going to use it to make uh, some kind of jacket. It's going to be dyed probably black, and uh, we do the carving, and everything is going to disappear. You're not going to see any uh, damage or repair on the first side. She's using black thread on the white skin because I'm going to dye the skin black so it doesn't matter. Otherwise, I would have just used a white thread. It's time consuming and expensive to repair the damages and often a substantial part of the pelt may be lost. Remember the investment in the pelt at this point for the manufacturer may already be three times the price he paid for the raw pelt. So every piece has value and will be used for something. Everything in the, in the box and eventually probably what is good in this is going to be sold to do something else. When you think that uh, someone is sitting at a, a fur machine and is putting all these little pieces together, it's amazing. Once the damage is repaired, it is stretched, tacked out and dried. Then it may be sent back to the dressers for drying or more shearing. When it returns, it is re-blocked, and using the pattern, the fur panels are cut and fitted to match each piece of the pattern. So this is just uh, the first process of uh, preparing the skin to uh, send them out for top shearing and the dyeing. Then the sewing begins by machine and by hand. Each panel must be cut, laid out, and re-sewn to make the beaver fur blend together. So the, the skin was cut every uh, four centimeter and just move half an inch each cut to make it uh, long like this. Lastly, the finishing touches. From the new art of sculpting the sheared fur to making the garments fully reversible, all add to the beauty of beaver. This is a pretty abbreviated look at the garment making process and is only intended to give you, our shippers, some insight into the travels of your pelts beyond the fur shed. It's important that everyone involved in our industry be aware of some of the detailed steps required to keep all of us doing what we love. A great deal of that burden for appealing to the customer lies beyond what has traditionally been the scope of the trappers. And it is vitally important that we not only understand, but support and work with all other segments of our industry. Our job is to supply the primest, most well-handled pelts we can produce. The job of the designers and manufacturers is to design and create innovative and unique ways to utilize our pelts and continually offer products that fascinate and excite customers about real fur thus creating long-term demand. Innovation is the key. A great example of thinking outside the box and developing new techniques for beaver was created by Paula Lishman, who came up with a unique and fascinating way to incorporate beaver into garments that were traditionally the domain of wool. The nice thing about this fabric is that it has a lot of give to it, so it can be quite long or shorter and wider. Paula's process combines fur with a cotton cord, forming the foundation for the fur and allowing the finely cut beaver to be woven into a stunningly beautiful array of light and warm shawls, sweaters and coats. The technique was so revolutionary, she was granted a Canadian patent on the process. Paula grew up in the North and was not only familiar with the fur, but a huge supporter of its use in the fashion industry. This is, shows how we cut a pelt around and around and around from the outside edge. So if these were cut lines, you could pull it and you get a long, narrow strip. And that's how we make a yarn from a fur pelt. And then with that yarn, we can knit it, weave it. This is crocheted ring shawl. One size fits all. They're great. And they come in lots of colors, as you can see behind me. One size fits all. Every Canadian woman who spends the winter in this country deserves one of these. Call me. I'll help you out. Paula's garments require a very high quality beaver, as she explains. 
So the beaver that we purchase, we want to buy beaver that's prime, caught under the ice. We need that really good, high quality, full, full, full fur beaver because we're working only with the underwool, so we need it to be prime. You know, I'm, I need to get 220 grams out of a beaver pelt. That's my average, that's what I'm going for in finished yarns. Would rather buy on the larger size so that I know I have a better chance of getting that amount of yarn from a beaver. I need as few guard hairs as possible, which means a hand pluck process, which is a lot more labor. And I know that our, our, our processing costs are more. We're looking at, you know, in the $50 range. And even the section of the pelt has an effect on the final garment. This is a beaver pelt that's been hand plucked. So all of the guard hairs have been taken out of it, but not sheared. So you can see the back is quite, the hair is actually quite long and curly. And then the hair on the flank section, this is a traditional belly split beaver, is much thicker and also much shorter considering this hasn't been sheared at all. The bag split beaver is of course my preference at the moment because it gives me all that good fur in the middle. This is the traditional belly split beaver and that and the traditional shape. This is how they, you know, they all come from the from the dresser. This one's also been dyed a walnut color. But there's the head and the tail. The, the pile underneath have been back split, so they've been split up the back here. So that makes the belly in the middle this nice big round part in the middle. And then the, my back, which this is also an ombre skin, so you can see Ombre is a beaver that's dyed without being bleached first. So ombre, of course, means shadow in French. So the difference in the color here, it's always darker on the center back. So this is the center back then of the beaver, which has the most guard hairs, but the least underwool. I mean, you guys as trappers know this. This is the part of the beaver that he curls up to protect himself and he's got all the guard hairs. But when you pluck them out, the underwool is not nearly as thick as the belly because the belly is the area that's protected that keeps the beaver the warmest, has the fewest guard hairs and the densest, you know, the densest underwool. Recently, she has been working directly with trappers so that they might fully understand the importance of handling their pelts specifically for her needs. This is a great example of how all segments of the industry should understand the needs and processes of everyone else who works with the pelts. Once the pelt has been dyed and blocked, it, it gets a, a much crisper texture, of course, than an unblocked pelt. And then this pelt will get trimmed around the outside edge. And then she just takes her knife and whatever the shape of the pieces, she cuts always from the outside edge. Draw a line an eighth of an inch from the edge. And then they do that for an hour or so and they have a bunch of lines. Cut on the line. And then when you run out of line, just keep cutting because you're always cutting a certain distance from the edge. So it's uh, just around and around and around. And the key to her technique is the way the beaver pelts are cut in long, thin strands and then wound with a heavy cotton thread. She's cutting from the back of the leather, of course, around and around the outside edge. So the first strip then gets processed by combining it with a very strong mercerized cotton thread called a spinning yarn and it gets twisted together with that first strip to make our beaver yarn that we use to knit, weave, crochet, macrame, tie parcels with. I mean it's yarn. You can use it for a lot of different things. It's very strong. This creates a fur yarn that can be woven or knitted using a number of different techniques for a variety of different garment styles. The range of colors and styles is amazing. Paula demonstrates the versatility of just one of her creations. This one is done in a combination of honeycomb over top of weaving. So I've honeycombed the beaver and woven it with squirrel and natural muskrat. The creative process is long and tedious work involving many steps from cutting the pelts to making the patterns, weaving and joining all the panels, almost all done by hand. Paula's innovative and stylish garments and her dedication to beaver in her designs is what keeps her and our industry on the cutting edge of fashion.
That's why it is so important for our members to understand all that goes into making it possible for us to do our part as fur harvesters. We need many, many more Paula Lishmans and their innovations. NAFA and the Wild Fur Shippers Council are constantly investing in programs to stimulate that innovation in students, designers, established manufacturers, and marketers of wild fur. And together with all segments of our industry, work tirelessly to create the consumer demand for our furs. Our future lies in that demand. From the flowage to the high fashion runways, we all must contribute to the success of our industry and lifestyle. That's the one. Very, very practical. That's, That's it. One. That's the one. Okay. Perfect.